Did I start? Okay. Um, hi. Thank you for being patient. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, but I'm Catherine. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I've actually been to, I'll talk about this a little, but I've been to 40 countries, but Spain is one of my favorite places to visit. Um, so I'm really excited to be here speaking in Madrid at Big Data Spain. Um, and today I will be talking about building a data science team from scratch. Um, and I, I grew up in New York, so I picked up a little bit of Spanish. So my alternative title for today is how to start a data science team when everyone is still using Excel. Um, I'm glad Excel translates. OK, but uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I put my Twitter up here and some hashtags if you want to tweet along to the conference. Um, but I am based in New York City. I am the senior data scientist and manager for Code Academy, which is a startup based in New York City. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's, um, it's a startup. It's an online platform for people learning how to code. Um, I've heard from a few people here who use it, which is always nice to hear. Um, but yeah, I was also the company's first data science hire. And before that, I have been doing statistical programming for um, over 10 years, which is really weird to think about, but <laughs> um, six years of that has been in a professional capacity, and for the past four years, I've been doing technical hiring and recruiting. Um, so I, another thing I didn't mention is I recently switched jobs. So I started at Code Academy a little over a year ago. Um, so for my talk today, I just want to talk about lessons learned from both sides of the hiring table as both um, a job applicant and now as a hiring manager. Um, so we have a lot to cover today, but my goal for the talk is that hiring managers will be able to um, effectively create like a good job application process um, and attract good candidates and the right candidates for the role. Um, and that job applicants will learn how to market themselves, um, how to crack the data science interview. Um, I think there's been a lot of literature about cracking the coding interview, but for data science, it's still fairly new, and a lot of companies are still trying to figure out how to effectively screen data scientists. So um, let's get started with... Um, Back to that first. <laughs> okay. um, so the first lesson learned is I think everyone in this room um, wants to hire data scientists or um, has worked for a company that's trying to hire data scientists or is trying to be hired as a data scientist. Um, but the number one lesson that I've learned over the past few years is no one can come to agreement about what a job title and the job descriptions look like. So um, I don't know how many of you have seen this article, but back in 2012, Harvard Business Review published an article that called data scientists like the sexiest job of the 21st century. Um, and this quickly went viral. So I pulled some data using um, the Google Trends package in R um, and plotted it in ggplot, and you can see the spike over here um, around the end of 2012, 2013, right after the article was released, and that's that inflection point when suddenly everyone was like, I need to become a data scientist. Um, and you can see that data analysis has been fairly stable, if not kind of like declining over time. Um, so a lot of people go back and forth between data analysis and data science. And I think as a data scientist, and I'm sure for a lot of you, a lot of questions that I hear from people is, what's the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist? Um, and I think it's all very relative. So job titles, I recently discovered data janitor is a job title. Um, and I actually, I, I really want to get my title switched because I think it's an accurate description of my job. Um, but because data science is such a new field, there isn't a lot of uniformity in how people, a data scientist in one organization might not be a data scientist in another. And even within one single organization, you have data scientists doing a lot of different things. Um, so 
Um, one of the other trends that we've noticed, um, and I missed Paco's talk, but I, I think he talked about this too, is um, I think hopefully we're going to trend towards uh, more companies standardizing um, job titles. So what we're seeing in the US and the States is a lot of the bigger tech companies. So at Lyft, they just announced that they're turning all data analysts into data scientists and all data scientists into decision scientists. Um, and I believe they did the same at Facebook, Spotify, um, Etsy, like a lot of big companies. So I think that will, with all these big companies doing it, will kind of guide the rest of the industry towards standardizing job titles. Um, but for now, for now I'll, I'll talk about the types of data scientists. So um, I really like this description that the director of um, data science at Stitch Fix answered in a Quora um, years ago, actually, but it's still highly relevant, where he kind of uh, generalized it into type A and type B data scientists. Um, and type A stands for analyze, so it's pretty easy to remember. So type A data scientists, I think, are, are the most common, um, commonly needed across organizations. So data scientists who analyze, right, they make sense of the data. Um, they, they don't really push models into production. Most companies don't really need to do that to begin with. Um, but they still have the statistical knowledge to make um, statistical inference from the data. Um, they also know a little bit of SQL, a little bit of R maybe, or Python, um, to clean the data that isn't really taught in traditional statistics curriculum. Um, so you're dealing generally with large data sets, and um, there are certain things that, no matter what kind of data scientist you are, um, there are some standard uh, foundation, foundational skill sets that everyone has. So data visualization, um, maybe eventually you specialize, and uh, one of the biggest things is just communi communicating your findings well. Um, so once you come to finding, uh, summarizing it in a way that makes sense. So a type B data scientist builds. So um, again, there's a lot of overlap with type A, so maybe everyone can be a little bit of both, but um, the data scientists who build, those are the ones that um, typically work with more ML models. Um, it's a lot more common in the tech industry um, because they're pushing models into production. And um, yeah, like the data that they deliver ends up in the product. Um, so you see that with Netflix recommendations, uh, maybe like uh, Uber, the Uber pricing algorithm, and so on. Um, so the second lesson that I learned is just a lot of, no matter how badly you want to do machine learning, the stage of your organization um, will determine what type of data scientists you can and, and should hire. So um, a little bit more about my background. Before Code Academy, I worked for JetBlue. Um, it's an airline in the States. It's uh, they don't fly to Europe, so they're basically like the Vueling or the Ryanair um, of the U.S. And they're the fifth largest airline um, in the U.S. It's pretty big. Um, but basically, over the course of a year and a half, I went from working at a company with over 17,000 employees um, to working at a small startup with about 100 people um, building out their first ever data science team. Um, so that was a huge transition for me. And I learned that different companies, different stages of companies have different data science needs. Um, so when I was working in corporate for six years, I felt like I was doing a lot of the same tasks over and over again. Um, but I was also stuck with a lot of legacy infrastructure and software that served as blockers and meant I couldn't innovate as much. Um, whereas once I moved to a startup, a lot of the infrastructure wasn't there. So whatever I wanted, I had to build. I had to work with software engineers, data engineers. Um, I had to request everything and basically start from scratch. Um, so I think before you even start recruiting for a data science team, building a data science team, you have to think about what type of data science work 
that your organization needs and just you know, be honest about it in the immediate term, what are we actually looking to achieve? Um, so I think there are different stages of companies that I mentioned, and um, companies in early stages of data science will focus on data collection. So a lot of it is designing the schema, designing the database, um, making sure ETL is run, aggregating um, maybe summary statistics or something overnight so you don't have to run those during the day. Um, and you're really just building out that foundation for analytics. So uh, in the past, another alternative job title for this is business intelligence or reporting. Um, so you're, you're making sure just there's basic visibility of the numbers, it's a lot of counting. Um, and then when companies hit a growth stage, um, your data warehouse is, maybe it still needs maintenance, some work once in a while, um, but it's in good enough shape so that you can produce insights. Um, so I would say that Code Academy is, is in growth stage. We're no longer truly a startup. We've been around since 2012. Um, so the data warehouse is in pretty good shape. We're capturing event data. Um, it's pretty clean. It could be better. Um, things can be slow, but we can run experiments on things and have it reach significance. Um, so companies that hit scale, that's when you get to deploy models um, and just scale up all the analysis that you're doing in growth stage. So maybe in growth stage, you were building um, models about lifetime value or customer churn, um, but you're doing it more to understand the business, and it's fairly static, less so um, it doesn't really go into production um, and change what the user sees. So um, just something to note when you're assessing the state of your data warehouse, um, when I say stages, it's not to conflate the age of a company with uh, what stage their data warehouse is in. Um, that's because one of the biggest things that I learned from working at older companies is that uh, a lot of these companies have a lot of technical debt. So coming from an airline, if you ever, I mean, I think some of you flew here um, and fly pretty often. If you go to, to the airport and you see the type of technology that airports work with, that was the type of technology that I had to work with at an airline. So it was really frustrating. Um, I think data scientists always complain that they spend like 80% of their time cleaning the data and then 20% of it analyzing for me was like 90, 95. Um, and we just had this really old legacy software and old infrastructure. Um, and it was prone to breakage and it made it really hard to analyze anything, much less push models into production. Um, so lesson three. Now that we've gone over type A and type B data scientists, um, a lot of people ask, well, I'm hiring my first data scientist, or um, what, what kind of data scientist should I get? Should I get someone who's into like, natural language processing? Should I get someone who's more of a generalist, who can do a little bit of everything? Um, where should I focus my efforts? And the biggest thing is, when you're starting out, it makes sense to go with a generalist and not specialize too early. Um, of course, that might be different depending on um, the goal of your business. If you're strictly doing NLP, then it might make sense to get a specialist early. Um, but a lot of this is because data scientists are expected to do all, all these different things, so have a little bit of expertise in all these domains. Um, but in reality, it's impossible for someone to possess all of this knowledge and at best, you hire people um, who are stronger in different areas, and you collectively build this repository of knowledge where you're sharing your code, doing code review, sharing ideas. Um, I borrowed this from the head of data science at Airbnb. I thought this was a really good summary as well. Um, so data science analytics and data science inference would kind of fall under a type A data scientist. So um, a data scientist doing analytics might do more data visualization, but not um, make any causal re relationships with the statistics. Um, so they might have a background in um, maybe like customer insights, or um, usually you don't need as much of an advanced degree. Um, Data scientists who do statistical inference, you want stronger statistical knowledge. If people are drawing conclusions and saying that the math backs it up, they have to have sound knowledge of that math. 
And then the middle, data scientist algorithms that would fall under our type B data scientists. So this is where you're building algorithms and the algorithms are the product. The algorithms are what they're producing. Um, so I'm gonna switch track now into technical interviews. So this is the part where if you're a hiring manager um, or involved in technical interviewing, you can learn how to screen candidates. And if you're looking for a job, you can learn kind of how hiring managers are thinking about this and what they're looking for. Um, so the fourth lesson and first lesson that I learned about technical hiring um, is that the, the hiring process for data science kind of sucks. Like it's not, it's not that standardized. Um, I think compared to software engineering where there's like a whiteboarding session and kind of general things that everyone does, um, a lot of data science interviewers are still trying to figure out how to even do that technical screen. Um, and I think the, the thing that I realized as I was looking at resumes is everyone claims to be an expert. Expert Excel, expert SQL, expert, um, I don't know, expert everything. Um, and some of these people are out of school, so I'm like, how can you be an expert at anything? Um, so this is kind of what our hiring process looks like at Code Academy. Um, since we're small, it, it gave us more time to be able to look through resumes, admittedly. Um, but this is probably true if you're getting started with hiring data scientists. I, I would recommend that you invest more time in it. Um, so we start with a resume review, um, and I try to screen out candidates who uh, maybe the skills don't really make sense together. So if someone has a lot of experience in Excel, then they're more of a business analyst than a data scientist. Um, or it helps if someone actually specifies what R and Python packages they work with. Um, a lot of people put down R or Python, they learned it in school, but if they can list what packages they actually use, NumPy, um, Pandas, Tidyverse, data table, um, that tells me that they actually use R and Python. Um, so once people get past the resume review, then we move on to the phone interview. And this is when, um, throughout this, I'm screening for two things. There's the technical skill, but then there's still the business sense, or really just common sense. Like, you come up with these numbers, but <laughs> is there, are you looking at things in a way where you know that there's something that we can do with it? Um, so during the phone interview, there are two questions that I really like to ask. So I mentioned the first one. Um, what's your favorite R or Python package and why? Um, if someone mentions a different, uh, a different coding language, I could ask it for that as well. Um, but I'm really just looking for a quick answer that gives me a better sense of how quickly someone can come up with, um, with an example of like a workflow or a way that they actually use R or Python. And then question two is where I ask for a case study. Um, tell me about an analytical project you worked on re recently. And this is where I'm looking for someone who can explain things in both a technical and business way um, and kind of talk about it in detail. Um, so during the same phone interview, the phone interviews are about 45 minutes long, I forgot to mention. So in the last 15 minutes, um, if the candidate passes the, the two questions and I kind of get the sense that they might be a good fit for the role, we'll move on to a pair programming exercise. Um, and you can't see the screenshot very well, but uh, this is what CoderPad looks like. Um, a lot of software engineers use it as well um, for remote pair programming exercises. So um, two people or three people, however many people, um, can be in the window at the same time remotely. Um, and as you type, you can see each other type. So um, it's, it's a really great tool for pair programming. Um, and we use it for SQL because that's kind of the lowest common denominator that we look for um, for data roles. Um, so I, I just look, f I'm mostly testing for advanced SQL queries, um, aggregates, joins, making sure people can get through it pretty quickly because um, we have to write a lot of SQL during the day. Um, and then a second thing that I screen for but isn't always necessary um, is if the SQL queries are optimized. So um, if people are doing select star all the time, then I know that they maybe haven't worked with very large databases. 
Um, I don't discount people because I, I don't think SQL is that hard to learn once you pick it up, but um, it, it's a bonus point. I, dec I definitely recommend it to data scientists to get better at SQL because I've seen a, a lot of very bad, uh, poorly optimized SQL code from data scientists. Um, so after the phone interview and the pair programming, when people pass that, um, we send home a take-home project by email. Um, so we, we give over, over some toy data set from our company data, so it's actually relevant, right? We want people to be excited about the questions that we analyze, um, and we want to see how they handle like a real-life situation. Um, so we give them a week to send it back, um, and I, I like to preface, I, I tell the candidates in the email, like, don't feel free, or uh, don't feel the need to work more than three, four hours on this. We give you the week for it to be flexible, because we're really, um, data science is such a competitive field, you want to make the process as smooth and flexible, but also as, you know, you want it to demonstrate the actual work that you'll be doing. Um, so the findings should include business conclusions, and, and that's really what we're looking for, just sound conclusions about the data. Um, and we recommend that people include supporting data visualizations or models, um, and people usually do. So um, once someone passes that, they come on for the final on-site interview. Um, and this is where it's a work in progress. We, actually, we do in-person whiteboarding um, as well, where since I already tested people in SQL and I can usually see someone's Python and R code in the take-home project, for the final on-site, I usually work with them to talk about designing a database or a schema. So let's say we're launching a new product and we need to log the clicks for this. What would you want it to look like? Um, and just kind of work through that to see if they come up with an answer that's like realistic and makes sense um, and that they can if you're making assumptions about the data, that you're able to defend it and explain why. Um, and then they go through the typical one-on-one -on -one meetings with the rest of the team, the meet and greets, um, just to make sure it's a good fit for everyone. Um, so lesson five. Um, so I mentioned this during um, the resume screen, but something that I think a lot of people do that's a huge pitfall with technical hiring is limiting your hiring pool. Um, by focusing on job titles. So we, we looked at the graph of the boom of the term data science. Um, that only happened in the past decade. So I've seen, um, I've seen job descriptions where people are like, we want at least 10 years experience as a data scientist. And that person doesn't exist. Um, so yeah, so I, I really recommend that we don't, you don't focus on job titles and you, um, assess candidates based on their skills. So a lot of industries don't even, haven't adopted the data science title yet. Um, I think government has been a little slow to adopt it in some older industries. Um, it's common in the tech industry, but um, like I said, you, if you limit yourself to looking for data scientists in the tech industry with 10 years experience, um, you're, you're go going to be disappointed. Um, but some alternative titles that you can look for are analysts, um, engineers, quants, specialists, um, and as we saw before, even data janitors. Um, so for job seekers, I think the same applies. So when you're reviewing job descriptions, don't focus on the job title. I know a lot of people really want the data scientist title, um, and, and it, it does provide a lot of mobility. But a title is a title, and if you're not getting the work that challenges you to actually grow as a data scientist, then um, it's not going to help you grow in your career. So don't just focus on the job title. Also, a lot of the time, job titles are um, negotiable anyway. Look at the responsibilities. So one of the things that I search for instead of searching for uh, job titles is I, I search for the tools that I work with. Um, so I look for SQL, R, Python, clustering, um, these are some examples of things that you can put up um, if you want to be more specific, although companies aren't great about doing this yet, but um, I think it froze. I think it froze. OK. 
sorry about that. More technical difficulties. Um, but for interviewers, same thing. Just um, don't focus on the title too much. And write truthful job descriptions. So one of the things that I highly recommend that hiring managers do, or HR, or if you're involved in the hiring process in any way, um, be really specific about um, Think about if you were applying to this job, would you get a sense of what you're actually doing out of this? So list different projects and tools. Um, yeah, make it representative of the actual job. So lesson six. Um, I really like this shift. I don't, I don't know where it came from, but I thought it was funny. Um, I also don't really know what's going on, like, like who's who in the relationship, but um, SQL, Python, R. So I think... The biggest lesson about um, technical hiring as well, if you want to expand your pool, is to be flexible about what tools you're allowing people to use. And the same applies once people start. Um, so if Python isn't a strict requirement, then in the job description, put down Python, R, maybe even SAS, um, SPSS. But allow job applicants to use their preferred stack. Um, and for job seekers, use the tools that you're comfortable with to showcase your skills. So I, um, I made this mis mistake when I was applying to jobs where I was learning something new and I was really excited about it. Um, and I wanted to show it off, but I, I wasn't that good at it. Um, and I didn't get that job. But <laughs> um, learning is great, but when you're interviewing for a job and it's a job you want, now's not the time to experiment with things that you're not super familiar with. So this is a time to really showcase what you're good at. And for interviewers, be flexible. So I mentioned um, I communicate explicitly to candidates in the email. Feel free to use whatever you want. And I, in the email, even say, even though I made fun of Excel at the beginning of this talk, um, even if you need to use Excel for some reason, um, feel free. And um, yeah, sometimes that's OK. It depends on the role. But for some of our entry level roles, people are still weaning themselves off of Excel. And if they're enthusiastic about it, that's OK. They can learn on the job. So final lessons. Um, lesson seven, even though uh, Harvard Business Review thinks we are the sexiest profession, data science isn't always the sexiest job. Um, so as an example, um, I actually didn't, I originally wanted to do a different talk about modeling um, time series analysis. And I came up with this great example of Google searches for Croatia and Spain. Um, and you can see how it peaks every other summer where Spaniards are looking to travel to Croatia. Um, I don't know why it's every other year, though, but I don't know that much about Croatia. Um, but there is a sudden spike. There is an outlier this year um, because of the World Cup final. So this is a fun toy uh, data set to look at. but. Um, Anomaly detection was something that I was using at work, and I thought it was exciting to talk about. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, my typical workflow looks a little more like this, um, where I feel like I'm constantly putting out fires. And I'm sure a lot of you feel like this as well, where um, the CEO or one of the product managers comes up to me and is like, why does this number look like this? Like, is something broken? Um, and I'm doing a lot of that and managing expectations. Um, but a lot of this work is really important. So the putting out fires, the uh, managing the day-to-day, -day, and also just planning out the roadmap for the team, like I mentioned today. Um, so I think just as a final takeaway for job seekers and hiring managers, make sure you're, you're prioritizing finding a good mutual fit. Um, so the job market in the States, you basically graduate from college, and a starting salary for data science is like six figures. So how can you compete with that, right? Like, you have to keep your data scientists happy. Um, and you have to make sure that you're offering your data scientists challenging problems, you're offering them visibility, um, you're letting them do good work and work that they're proud of and interested in. Um, so I think when you're looking for a job, really think about what type of role you want. So do you want to be a generalist or a specialist? Like, for me, um, I like working on a bunch of different things. I specialized for a long time. So for me, I, I really wanted to go back to generalizing. Um, and do you want to work at an early stage or late stage company? Um, all of those are personal choices that you should think about before you, you start your job hunt. Um, and just be really clear about what skills you bring to the table. Now is the time to 
to showcase what you can do. Um, and for hiring managers, I think just be realistic about what your company needs for maybe the next year. Um, so don't think five years from now, we want to be doing um, this type of modeling, so we should hire this person. Um, that's, that's good for no one. Like It'll take you a lot of time to find that person, and it's not realistic. Um, so really think of the skills that are nice to have versus um, you need them immediately. So f for skills that are nice to have, screen people based on potential. Um, data scientists are really curious by nature. We learn really quickly. Um, I have a lot of people on my team who learn so much on the job. Um, and it's, it's been amazing. So um, again, ensure that you're offering mutual growth and satisfaction and uh, keep your data scientists happy and interested. Um, so I'm going to post these slides online so there are some additional resources. Um, and that's it. Thank you for having me. Um, and I hope to see you all soon. But let me know if you have questions. I think we have a few more minutes. No? No more questions? Wait, do we have time for questions? Oh. Okay, I think we're, we're out of time for questions, but I'll be around. There's technical difficulties, but you can catch me on this side. Thank you.